but we're just going to kind of kick it off with you guys kind of like the progenitors of how Battletech came about. We're just going to go with it. Uh, all right, so um, God created the Earth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, soon afterwards. Um, all right, well, I guess actually, I'll, I'll start with how did Fasa come about? Yeah, because I didn't even read the story. So. That, that then leads to uh, how Battletech comes about. So I was uh, um, an awful student. Um, and uh, well, actually, go back even further, because it actually, I know many of you have been incredibly gracious to uh, thank you, thank me for uh, for a game that you love. And that that is really heartwarming, because it's, it's really just playing it forward, because I had that same relationship uh, um, and life-changing experience with Dungeons and Dragons. Um, I was a severe, uh, dyslexic, and like many dyslexic, I got really good at cheating my way through school. So I had gotten to the point of being 16 and not really able to read yet. Um, and I was I didn't really see a need for it um, to read because everything I could you know cheat my way through everything. And then I was a, a junior counselor at a summer camp in Wisconsin the year that Dungeons and Dragons came out. And one of the counselors um, had an early first edition copy, and he brought it to camp and uh, and played it with us. And my head exploded. Um, and that became uh, that that was what I wanted to be, was what I wanted to do. And to do that, I need to learn to read. I need to read those rules. And then there was all these things that had been stolen from Tolkien, and I didn't know Tolkien at all. Peter Jackson was many many decades in the future. Um, so for me, uh, Tolkien was, you know, my C. Dick and Jane run books, uh, <laughs> slowly working my way through Tolkien, but by the end of it, I could read. Um, and so, I mean, in terms of, you know, games having impact on your life, that was certainly the very beginning of how games had a huge impact on my life. Um, and then, <laughs> why we're on that divergent, or, uh, uh, I, I went back home to Chicago, talked to all my friends about this incredible thing that we needed to go get this game. So we all got back in our cars, we drove to Lake Geneva, and we went to the only place in the world that you could buy Dungeons and Dragons at the time, which was Gary Gygax's house. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and they had converted the, the floor of, Gar of Gary's house into a store. And the guy manning the store the day we were there um, <laughs> was, um, hold on, brain just right co-authored Dungeons and Dragons, um, Dave Artisan. Yeah. So uh, Dave was manning the store, and we came in and we bought like seven copies, which was like a big deal. That was like a big sale. And he, he said, well, you want me to run you on an adventure? Like, sure. So we go to Gary's kitchen, and, <laughs> and they had set up the kitchen uh, with, you know, kind of there was a breakfast nook, and, and, uh, and like a table, and they had put a um, perforated uh, board with like a little cutout, like a bank tower, right? And Dave sat behind that. And Dave had an incredible speaking voice. He was really just very, very dramatic. And and so the player sat this way, and, and, and he now was, you couldn't see him. It was this disembodied voice, right? Uh, and, and he would just launch into the story, and every once in a while, a hand would come out and say, roll these. <laughs> um, and it was a fantastic experience. He killed us with rats, not big ones, small ones, um, and uh, and we were hooked. You know, so that was the beginning of, of my gaming career and uh, and and learning to read. Uh, and so I went through um, back to being a bad student. Um, uh, was a lousy student before. Now I had, now I could read, but I was still a lousy student because I was still making up dungeons now and doing all that. Um, that sounds very familiar. <laughs> yes. So. Uh, I went to the United States, my, my short college career is the United States Merchant Marine Academy, uh, which you have to get a congressional appointment for, which if you're on any of the coasts, it's really hard to do, but if you grow up here in Chicago, everybody's like, what's a ship? <laughs> yeah. So it uh, wasn't that hard to get the appointment from here. Um, and, uh, and while there, they had just opened up this bridge simulator. It was a $50 million thing, and it was designed to teach ship pilots um, um, how to bring ships into port without, like, Hitting bridges and uh, oh, things, things, yeah. things like that, um, and we uh, we didn't get to use it, but we got to tour it. And I saw that thing, and I was like, "That's the future of entertainment, right there." That you get to go. There's this immersive experience, being able to 
being, you know, projected, you know, around you, all this, this. And this is, this is what, 1984, 83? This is 80, no, no, 79. Wow. Really? And this is, you were talking like wireframe graphics? Oh, I mean, there were dozens of polygons on this guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it was really, I mean, very crude. Mm. But, uh, but it was, at, but it was a real ship. Fifty million. It was like, a re, it was a real ship equipment and then just dozens of polygons. Right, 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 right. around you. Okay. And I was like, $50 million, I could do that with my Apple too. <laughs> I was wrong. <laughs> I tried anyway, so I dropped out of school on a came home, and I was like, we could do this with a network, and there was no such thing as a network, so we were running direct serial connections between motherboards of Apple IIs, which is how I fried my first Apple II, which was only, it was with number 516 Apple II ever made, and fried the motherboard of Apple II. If I kept that, I could have paid for my kid's comic. But, um, anyway, but, uh, but I was determined to build this kind of uh, immersive simulated experience. Uh, and so I put together a business plan, I went out and talked to investors, and, uh, and surprisingly they said, one, we don't understand the fuck what you're talking about. <laughs> you wanna make a, we don't know what a video game is, you, want to pe you want people to come to a location to play a video game which we don't understand, and your college dropout has never done anything. So yeah, sure, here's the money. No, they didn't say that. <laughs> um, so they were like, go away kid, you're bothering us. Um, and so, at that point I was like, well, I'll start a tabletop game company, get rich overnight. As one does. Yeah, exactly. yeah. yeah. I just well, okay. back in the day, you could conceive, like, actually seriously think like that could happen. No, I mean, no, no. It, no, 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 no. it did, no, it was just complete naivete. Yeah. Which I've learned is actually the most beneficial thing to an entrepreneur, is, is really not knowing anything. <laughs> Well, we're uh, taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> so I was, um, I've been drawing up these uh, deck plans for playing Traveler uh, with my friends. And, oh, thank you. Um, uh, and so one day at the table with my, my gaming group, I said, I'm going <coughs> to print these up and, uh, and see if anybody wants to buy them. Who wants to come in for 50 bucks and be my partner? Ross said, yeah, sure, I'm in. Thus started a 40-year career. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, so we printed them up and and, uh, and took them around to local game shops and then eventually Mark Miller saw some and he asked us if we wanted to do them under license for Traveler. That's how we got fast to start it. And then uh, doing Traveler stuff and then we did the Star Trek RPG. Well, actually, Traveler, Grab Ball, Behind Enemy Lines, and then uh, Star Trek RPG. Um, and I was at a game show, I mean, not a game, I was at a hobby shop, a hobby show, which was like mostly like RC and, and uh, models models and railroads and stuff like that. But there was, there was like only a couple of us in the games business there. And uh, there was a guy who was importing remaindered uh, uh, model kits, small scale model kits from uh, Crusher Joe and Matt Cross and mm -hmm. Southern Cross. Because they were discontinued in, in Japan because the, the series was off the air. Um, so he had a whole bunch of them that he he was trying to unload, and I thought I saw those. I thought they were incredibly cool. Um, so I said, "Can you know, if I buy enough of these, can I put them in as the playing pieces in a game?" Uh, and I said, "Well, we'll have to get permission from the studio." So was, you said it's a model kit. Or a model kit. Yeah, yeah. Well. yeah. So you assemble those arms, legs, and just put yeah, no, it's just classic little model kit. Yeah, like gun cloth. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and uh, and so we got he got permission from the studio. And uh, and so Battle Droids came out with uh, two model kits and then a, and, and paper stuff. Uh, you know, all the all the rest of the components were paper. Uh, and so I started looking at the story for for Matt Cross and Southern Cross and Crusher Joe and those. But yeah, those are very Japanese stories. And uh, <laughs> so um, I wanted to you know create a different, a very different kind of fiction. Um, at, this was now by this point eighty. Four, three? Mm -hmm. I mean, you're just as good. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, somewhere in that way. Yeah, yeah. I do really bad in years. And, like, um, and uh, so we were, you know, as we've been for a long time in this incredible technological upward curve, and I thought it'd be interesting to set the fiction against a, a, a technological retrograde. Um, and so historically, we've had several of those, but the most dramatic of those, of course, was the uh, Roman successor states, which led into, you know, began the slide into the Dark Ages, um, the yeah, medieval. And uh, so I used that as the as the foundation and started writing all sorts of crazy shit and hiring other people to write all sorts of crazy shit. And that's why we're here 40 years later.
<laughs> so, Mike, if you want to pick up the ball there and tell the folks how you got started, because you were oh, I, well, I was, one of the first writers who came on board, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I was I was working for Flying Buffalo at the time, a uh, game company out of Arizona, and they had published the second role-playing game ever, Tunnels of Trolls, um, which I had I had I was living in Vermont, uh, no no one to teach me any of these games, and I had bought. Uh, Dungeons and Dragons, the the white box set, and and, and especially I remember having to buy chainmail. And <coughs> if you read the chainmail rules, if you didn't understand miniatures, there are stupid things in there like a horse can move a half an inch. What the fuck? Horses can move a lot more than half an inch. How do you have a horse that moves only half an inch? I mean, I, you know, you know, just no concept of, of miniatures or anything like that. And then. I, I was um, I had gotten a flyer from Flying Buffalo, and they had Tunnels of Trolls, and they had Solo Adventures, and Tunnels of Trolls was was really a stripped down role playing game, very simple system. And uh, Rick Loomis, the, the founder of Flying Buffalo, had written Buffalo Castle, which was a choose your own adventure, and and I just thought that was brilliant. <coughs> and I wrote up. Uh, I didn't know that because that predated the other. <coughs> oh, hell yeah! Oh, hell yeah! Long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so um, uh, I, uh, uh, you know, just uh, started buying their stuff. I wrote a couple of solo adventures and sent them off, and, and Rick did not buy those, um, just because they were they were very much the same. They were very similar to Buffalo Castle. They were very very spare. Uh, and so then I said, okay, I can do something he'll buy, and I did a solo adventure called City of Terrors, which was the largest one that. That Flying Buffalo ever published, and it was it was greatly expansive, and it was the difference. And this was just part of the evolution of the of the way the industry ended up going. You know, Buffalo Castle and and, and the other solos and a lot of just regular dungeons at the time were, uh, you know, it, it were a mapping exercise. You know, you turn left at this intersection, and then you got to come back. So you're you're doing the <coughs> mapping and stuff. And with, with City of Terrors, um, what I was writing was little vignettes. Uh, and your choices were not go left or go right. You know, you're making more moral choices. You know, you hear laughter coming from over here. You hear someone screaming from over there. You know, which do you go to? Uh, and 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 again, you know, that's that's kind of how the stuff evolves. So, Flying Buffalo uh, bought City of Terrors um, when I was a junior in college, uh, and then uh, when I graduated, I moved out to Arizona to work for them. Uh, and started going to started going to conventions, and that's when I saw you guys. Didn't really didn't really know you, but then was it '85? I think um, uh, Dragonlance had come out, and and the novels hit, and that was a revolution in the industry. And it would have been either in '84 because the because no, yeah, I, 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 I thought our first novel came out before that, right? When, no, no right? didn't Keith's book come out before Dragonlance? I thought they came out roughly at the same time. Okay. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Thunder Roof was eighty-seven. It was eighty-seven. Okay, yeah. 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 I think I think Dragonlance was like forty-five. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah. I remember, and, and, and I tried to sell a, a nineteen eighty-four. Okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so, but that was <coughs> the novel suddenly became a revolution in the industry yeah, in terms of it. It really had expanded. It was another product that could go out there. And I remember a game designers workshop, which is the company Mark Miller had for Traveler. Uh, you know, later on, after I was doing work for you, you know, they they approached me for doing novels for them for Dark Conspiracy, and one of the things they said is, really, since Dragonlance, you know, you can't launch a game line if you don't have fiction going for it. But uh, but you had just had the decision at Thunder Rift come out, and I had written, so this would have been uh, Origins '86. I had written a novel, uh, a, a novel which eventually was published, Italian Revenant, uh, published by Phantom. Uh, and I remember walking up and talking to you, and and uh, at the booth saying, "Hey, you know, you've done novels. I, I, uh, you know, I, I, I can do. I can write a novel. Would you, you know, if you got any work, you know, in essence. I mean, this is how freelancers and flying buffalo allows to freelance. And and I remember Jordan, uh, the look on your face was, "Oh Jesus, another game designer who thinks he can write." <laughs> which, which, to be fair, would have been my look if someone had said that, you know, at my booth. So yeah. <laughs> But uh, 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 and, I, and Jordan said, "Well, we have this new game coming out, Renegade Legion. Uh, you know, we'll get you some stuff." And that was the, the set of conversations. And I uh, sent them uh, chapters and stuff from uh, uh, from Italian Revenant as well. 
I sent a short story that I'd done, an ogre short story that I'd done, because it's got explosions in it, uh, which I thought would be <laughs> important that they could see that I could handle explosions. Um, First and, experience of, of the word Azure. You, yeah, there you go, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, uh, but I remember getting a phone call then from Ross, and Ross always had a very deadpan delivery on everything. And, uh, uh, and uh, you know, I answered the phone, and Ross says, uh, and then in the meantime, they had sent me a, a whole bunch of Battletech stuff because Renegade Legion stuff wasn't ready yet. So I had, you know, had, uh, uh, photocopies of, of house books that hadn't gone together, you know, some novels and things. And so, again, being a freelancer, I just sort of devoured that stuff while I was waiting for your site. So uh, Ross calls and he says, uh, "Hey, you know, got the got the six chapters of the novel you sent, and, and you know, like to read the rest of it." And I said, "That's great." And Again, I'm a freelancer, and so I said, uh, you know, I got the stuff you guys sent, and uh, you know, I've read through those Battletech stuff, and and uh, you know, I've got a couple of ideas. So if you ever need any Battletech stuff, just let me know. And Ross says, that's what we want to talk to you about. We want you to write a trilogy. And I'm thinking, okay. And then Ross says, yeah, hundred thousand <laughs> words each book. Uh, you've got nine months. Oh. <laughs> and, and and this is the this is the moment in a freelancer's life where you realize that if you say no, you have absolutely nothing. If you say yes, you have a chance at something. You know, and three hundred thousand word novels in nine months. Yeah, you know, I, I didn't have to be put on my track shoes and hope I was running downhill, but yeah, you know, so it's possible. Well, it's born from our ignorance of what it would take to write that. Well, well yeah, <laughs> this, is, this is the great fun of, 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 you know, the whole learning experience. It just Don Ippolito, who was their editor at the time, when I sent uh, Warrior on Guardian, I remember the phone call from her. Uh, she said, um, this is like a real novel. Yes, good. You know, I mean, but but uh, you know, so so uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just racing with Ross's thing, and and, uh, and he and he says, so, so can you do that? And I said, yeah, piece of cake. <laughs> uh, and uh, and, uh, and then because uh, uh, then we, I talked to you at Origins, and then we met again at Gen Con. Uh, and that's where we, you know, talked up some some general concepts and stuff like that. And that's that's where we kind of launched into these things and and uh, and got going. And then for those of you who are wondering, since I just recently read them, not only is all the Warrior books great books, they're also each one is over a hundred thousand words. <laughs> yes, so yes, now yes, they are. Yeah, we yeah, went yeah. over the, the required word. Well, and and, <laughs> and it actually took me ten months. But the only reason for that is they had me do other work in the interim. <laughs> you know, so so it was you know so so it was one more month for uh, it's either the Kellogg short book or the, or the Stratmore short story, one oh, or the other. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Be sure to smash our like button and subscribe to our channel. Crowdfunding is when lots of people give you small amounts of money to help your passion project come to life.